Good afternoon, everyone. Going in and out. If you can hear me in the back, raise your hands. Okay. We're gonna get going in about two minutes. Okay, everyone. Hello. Hey. Hi, everyone. I'm Kathleen, and I'm a woman in long-term recovery. And what that means is I haven't used a drink or a drug since January 15, 1993. I really love all the passion. I want to see all that passion when it's time to clean up at the end of the day. We've got about one minute, we're going to get ready to get going. That doesn't mean we start chanting again. I want to continue, I want to continue, I would like to continue to remind you that when we are not eating or drinking, we need to have our masks on up over our nose and under our chin. Let's remember that we're trying to show the world that we can gather and be responsible. And so far, you guys are doing an amazing job. So this afternoon, we're going to have a wonderful keynote panel. Then we're going to go over the individuals that were nominated for World Council. They'll have their speeches. Jackson Longen is going to come up and handle that. We're going to hear about donations, director's awards for Oxford, Inc. Some folks from our finance department are going to talk a little bit about what that means for, for us to have that. And then we're going to ha pass out the 100-year director's awards, which, as you know, are really about giving, you guys giving to us and helping Oxford House Inc. be stable, even through a pandemic, um, it has really been an amazing thing. So did you all get to some good panels this morning? There are several people that are missing phones. So if you find a phone somewhere, if you could please turn it in, maybe over at the registration desk or the VIP desk, that would be great. I think it looks like we've got about everyone in here. We have 1,500 people here. I am now going to turn over the mic to Marty Walker, who's a senior outreach person who many of you know, who's full of energy. In life, um, and I'm very happy to turn over this wonderful panel to him, Marty. Man, what time is it? It's time for a freaking convention. What time is it? That's right. That's right. All these people getting all loud stuff back there. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. We ain't got time for all that. Um, man, I am nervous because I'm in, I get to introduce these heavy hitters up here, man. So let me get this straight. So Mr. Sabbat, he's not here. That's correct. Okay. Okay. So. Uh, but we have a video. But we have a video. So. Uh, the keynote panel, Facing Addiction, will focus on current... Oh, my name is Marty. I'm a uh, person in long-term recovery. And what that means to me 
is that I haven't had to shoot dope or, or, or uh, vomit alcohol since March 15th of 1998. And for that, I'm truly grateful. Uh, the keynote panel, Facing Addictions, will focus on the current research and practice and discuss how the face and treatment of addiction have cha has changed over time. In 2016, then Surgeon General Vivek Murthy published a report title, entitled Facing Addiction in, in America, the Surgeon General's Report on Alcohol, Drug, and Health. That report called for a comprehensive approach to address substance use problems in the U.S. It also gave a shout out to Oxford House. Uh, much has happened since the time of that report. While treatment and awareness has been vastly improved, drug potency has increased and led to increased overdoses, many fatal. We know that. Furthermore, the pandemic has had its effects also. The panelists will discuss these developments, current research and practice, their thoughts on what has changed since 2016 and what new approaches are being used or sh should be considered going forward. The panel will, with a few comments by the moderator and introductions of and brief presentations by each of the panelists. Presentations will include summaries of current research and practice. A moderated discussion will then focus on the topic and time will be left at the end for audience questions. The panelists are all researchers, practitioners, and experts in various aspects of addiction. So uh, I'm going to ki start kicking it right off. Are you all ready? Are you all ready? Hey, can we give our panelists a freaking Oxford House welcome? Make it loud, make it proud. We took a lot of time to get here, baby. It's been two freaking years. So I want to thank you guys for showing up. Okay, let me get to this. Uh, let me unfreeze my phone. Okay, so first up, Mr. John Kelly, PhD, ABPP, Professor of Psychiatry, Harvard University Medical School. Mercy, mercy, mercy. Okay, Dr. Kelly, here's his bio. But let's check this out. I got a GD, but this guy's off the chain. <laughs> Dr. Kelly is the Elizabeth R. Spalin Professor of Psychiatry and Addiction Medicine at Harvard Medical, the first endowed professor in addiction medicine at Harvard. He is also the founder and director of the Recovery Research Institute at the Massachusetts General Hospital the and the direct associate director of the Center for Addiction Medicine, CAM, and MGH, and the Program Director of the Addiction Recovery Management Service, ARMS. Dr. Kelly is a former president of the American Psychological Associations, APA, Society of Addiction Psychology, and is a fellow of the APA and the diplomat of the American Board of Professor, Professional Psychology. Boy's got some freaking education, man. <laughs> He has also served as the consultant to the U.S. federal agencies and non-federal institutions, as well as foreign governments and the United Nations. So the guy's worldwide. What's going on there? Dr. Kelly has published over 200 peer-reviewed articles, reviews, chapters, and books in the field of addiction medicine, and was the author was an, was an author of the U.S. Surgeon General's Report on Alcohol, Drugs, and Health. His clinical and research work has focused on addiction treatment and the recovery process, mechanisms of behavior change, and reducing stigma and discrimination among individuals suffering from addiction. Let's have a round warm applause for Dr. Kelly, baby. Thanks so much. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm just so honored and delighted to be here. Thank you for having me. Thanks for the opportunity to be with you all. Um, I'm still pumped from the last time I came and spoke here, which was three years ago, I think. Um, I'm still energized by you all. Thank you for everything that you do. Um, 
when Paul uh, Malloy asked me to, to speak, um, you know, he's always kind of 50, he's a bit cool on PowerPoint, you know, and he says, you know, you can use slides if you want, if you have to, you can use slides. And I, I always feel a bit naked uh, with pow without PowerPoint. And, um, and I remember I was uh, actually, I was asked to speak as a scientist at the World Convention, the Alcoholics Anonymous World Convention, a few years back in, in Georgia, in Atlanta, Georgia. And um, they said they said definitely no slides, right? No slides. So uh, so I said I said at that convention I said you know well you know I have to forego PowerPoint and uh, rely on my higher PowerPoint um, for that one. So uh, um, but um, but in this case I'll have to rely on my higher PowerPoint and and PowerPoint here. So uh, so thank you. In the next eight or nine minutes uh, I have with you, and we're going to have a discussion, I believe, afterwards, but um, I'd like to talk to you about the recent science and evidence that's been accumulated uh, on Alcoholics Anonymous and 12-step approaches to recovery. I'd just like to acknowledge my colleagues in, in this work and the funding through the Recovery Research Institute at the Massachusetts General Hospital. You know, one of the things when we think about approaches to addiction, which of course is a deadly disorder, which kills hundreds of thousands of people in the United States every year, it kills many millions worldwide. Um, uh, we think about that, uh, those, the lethality of it, the disease burden, the disability associated with it, the economic burden. Um, and when we, sometimes when we think about our modern era of neuroscience and genomics and pharmacogenetics, um, we might think, or the criticism has been leveled against uh, approaches that are uh, ostensibly, you know, referring people to church basements to work on a set of religiously worded steps. Should that be the, the modern era of treatment? And this is a criticism, of course, um, against 12-step uh, approaches. This kind of criticism and skepticism has persisted through the decades. In fact, you can see here on the screen, um, it, it was around at the time when AA started. This is actually a quote from 1937, just two years after the origin of AA with Bill W. and Dr. Bob. And it's actually Charlie Towns, who was the head administrator of Towns Hospital in New York City, and he says, when my head doctor, Dr. Silkworth, began to tell me of the idea of helping drunks by spirituality, I thought it was crackpot stuff. But I've changed my mind. One of, one of these days, this bunch of ex-drunks of yours is going to fill Madison Square Garden. Now, <clears throat> of course, I looked up the capacity of Madison Square Garden at 17,000. So... Uh, right now, that has been exceeded right now by about 150,000 times, <laughs> right now. So um, there's something obviously to it that changed this guy's mind. He was skeptical, like many people are skeptical of spiritual approaches. Um, and in fact, um, the whole research and scientific picture on AA and 12-step approaches has only recently been clarified. And that's what I'm going to brief you on today. Um, it started 30 years ago with this report you can see on the, monitor, on the screen here. This was from the, uh, a fancy organization called the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences. And at the time, it said, look, there's this thing called Alcoholics Anonymous. It's very influential. It's influencing our, tre our treatment system. But we don't have good quality, rigorous research on its efficacy and its mechanisms, and we need to do it. What that did back then 30 years ago with this call from the Institute of Medicine it really, for the first time, legitimized serious scientific investigation into Alcoholics Anonymous and 12-step uh, uh, treatments. Um, what that meant was that the National Institutes of Health, the Department of Veterans Affairs, put money behind research to investigate, does it work, how does it work? And that's what I'm gonna tell you about. Since then, there's been approximately, well, there's been dozens and dozens of very high quality trials that have been done. What I'm going to tell you about is the top uh, cream of the crop from these trials, the most scientifically rigorous trials and what was found um, in what was called a Co Cochrane review. Now, the Cochrane system, I won't go into it too much to bore you, but um, you can consider it as the gold standard 
in medicine for systematic reviews of the science in any given area of psychiatry or medicine. Okay, it's the system to which governments look and big healthcare systems look for clinical decisions on what should be adopted and implemented in clinical care settings. So what we did um, about four or five years ago now is we embarked upon one of these, what they call Cochrane reviews. It's a systematic gold standard review of the science on Alcoholics Anonymous and 12-step treatments uh, designed, these are clinical treatments designed to link patients to Alcoholics Anonymous as a form of relapse prevention and continuing care, similar to what would be done in clinical settings regarding CBT, but in this case, it's delivered by a clinician uh, in different formats and intended to link patients with these free community-based uh, resources. So, as I mentioned, in this review, we included only the most rigorous trials. There were, in fact, 27 studies which made it into the review. It had to be either a randomized control trial, that's the gold standard, or uh, a comparative effectiveness trial that wasn't randomized, but otherwise was very rigorous, had a control group or comparison group, and, and was prospective, followed patients up over time. We also included healthcare economic studies, because we wanted to look at the healthcare cost offset of linking patients to AA who had severe alcohol addiction. These were the outcomes uh, that we looked at in, these, in this study. We looked at a variety of different abstinence outcomes. In fact, all outcomes were, it could be included. These are the ones that were reported. Uh, abstinence, um, percent days abstinent, continuous abstinence, the proportion of patients who are absent and in remission, uh, intensity of drinking, consequences, uh, alcohol-related consequences, uh, addiction, alcohol addiction severity, and economic uh, factors. So we had a total of 27 primary studies in this report. The majority were randomized controlled trials. Um, there were five, uh, four economic studies, uh, about uh, 160, 150 uh, different scientists from 67 different institutions uh, were incorporated in the review. We had 11,000 patients uh, who were uh, participated in this review in, in these studies. So what did we find? Well, interestingly, and I think surprising to many people, is that these clinical linkages performed by clinicians in randomized controlled trials, when compared to other kinds of psychotherapies for addiction, like cognitive behavioral treatment or motivational enhancement therapy, did as well or better outperformed these other kinds of interventions, which were more sophisticated and grounded in clinical science. So a, sim a, a simple clinical linkage, uncomplicated clinical linkage to these free ubiquitous indigenous recovery support resources was as good as other kinds of therapy on every single uh, dimension except continuous abstinence and remission where 12-step facilitation treatment linking patients to AA did substantially better. You can see it here in the blue bars. This is in the most rigorous manualized randomized controlled trials you can see the magnitude of difference relative to other kinds of treatments like cognitive behavioral therapy. In the yellow bars here, you see the relative improvement. This is a 20 to 60% relative improvement in long-term remission for patients linked to AA relative to cognitive behavioral therapy or motivational enhancement therapies or other kinds of therapies. So that is an impressive um, uh, improvement. When you consider uh, if we were talking about cancer, for example, a 20 to 60% improvement in terms of long-term remission is massive. Colon cancer kills 50,000 people every year. Alcohol kills 100,000. So you can think about the 20 to 60% improvement in long-term remission rates. That has a very meaningful impact, not only in terms of clinical outcomes, but also in terms of economic benefits. What we found in this study was that patients linked to AA not only had better outcomes, but also reduced the healthcare burden substantially. When we extrapolated across the United States in terms of all those patients every year, roughly one million who are treated for alcohol addiction, if we were to uh, link patients who had severe alcohol addiction to AA every year, we'd save roughly $15 billion in healthcare costs while also improving remission rates. What we also found when we looked in the study was that the way the 12-step facilitation worked, the way that uh, the, the clinical linkages worked, was in fact 
getting people more involved in AA. That was the mechanism by which they worked. So what did we find in how AA itself conferred this benefit? Because the treatment got people to go to AA and therefore helped them to sustain higher remission rates. But what about AA itself? How did that work? These were the empirically supported mechanisms through which, this is in two different systematic reviews here I'm showing you that looked at mechanisms of behavior change. But what we found here is that the way that AA conferred benefit was by mobilizing the same kinds of therapeutic mechanisms that are mobilized by formal treatments, but do so in the communities in which people live over the long term for free. And what are some of those mechanisms? Well, these are things which are very common in treatment. AA boosts cognitive and behavioral coping skills. People learn, of course, from one another with lived experience about how to stay sober and cope with the demands of sobriety. It boosts their confidence and their ability to cope with high-risk relapse situations. It keeps motivation high. It reduces impulsivity. It reduces craving. It improves spirituality and meaning and purpose in life. And you see that big, that big one, that big orange bubble right there? That is the social network. That was the biggest factor. It helps people shift. You, you guys know that too well already, right? It shifts your social network towards people who are in recovery with lived experience, who know how to stay sober, and away from people who are drinking and using drugs. It's what Carl Jung refers to as the protective wall of human community. So what did we find? In essence, we found that for alcohol-related outcomes, other than complete abstinence, AA and professionally delivered 12-step interventions are at least as effective as other well-established treatments. For abstinence outcomes, complete abstinence and remission, AA and 12-step interventions are better than well-established treatments. Implementing AA and 12-step facilitation treatments also appear to produce substantial healthcare cost advantages and we know that the way that AA confers this benefit is similar to the way that formal treatment works, except it's able to do this over the long term in the communities in which people live. I always refer to AA as the closest thing that public health has to a free lunch. It's a, a true gift that we have, and groups like it. Think about, think about all the positive benefits that come from this freebie that we've got in the community. Not just AA, NACA, AMA, you name it. There's an anonymous fellowship, helps those countless millions of people who suffer, as well as their families. It's not the answer for everyone or for everything, but it's one sure-footed method that we now have very solid evidence, as good, as good evidence as for any other area. Uh, of our approaches to addiction. So with that, I'll say thank you, and I'll see you later. Thank you. Man, that gives me chills. You know, when you were talking, thank you so much. We're all oh. What, uh, what came to mind while he was talking and all that research, that's a lot of, man, they care about us, man, you know? Um, because when I was using, well, for, you know, for the first 35 years of my life, I didn't think that anybody cared about me at all, you know? And they want to figure out how to help us. That's, this is what I gathered from this. This isn't like they're trying to intrude upon my anonymity you know, I didn't care about my anonymity. When I've got fugitive watch pictures all over the freaking newspapers. I didn't, I wasn't anonymous then, you know. Um, so, you know, I'm just thinking, look, that's a lot of, that. that I, all I can say is thank you, you know. Um, yeah, that's kind of awe-inspiring. They're trying to figure out how to make us, help us help ourselves better, you know. There's a lot of effort going into that, so. Oh, it's just the biggest resistor of that is me, you know? I keep going back to old behaviors, and sometimes we die. So 
hopefully they can catch us before we do. We lost a lot of people this last couple of years, huh? You know, it's been hard. It's been freaking hard. So I don't know about you, but I've been looking forward to this right Yeah, You know what I mean? Right, yeah. And don't forget to vote for Brandy B. I heard her back there. So let me get to... Uh, you want to do it first? You want to do the doctor? Okay, I don't have his bio. But Dr. Hoffman is part of uh, the board of directors. He's been with us for a long time. And you might have heard Dr. Hoffman. He's done a lot of work, too. Is that your bio? Did you write your bio for me? You want me to read it? No? So, with no, without further ado, uh, Dr. Hoffman's going to break us off some of the stuff that he's been working on, too. And he's part of the board of directors. So, let's have a warm 2021 welcome to Dr. Hoffman. <laughs> Oh, okay. Well, you just hit my weak point. Thank you. But I actually started my um, medical career. I never would have thought I would have gotten into addiction, but um, the mentor I had in Hawaii, which was a nice place, uh, was one of the a walking encyclopedia, knew anything that had been published in any journal and uh, kind of uh, created the Army's program at that time. So I became, oh, this is a really good model. And, um, and the, for those that don't know the origins of the, of the Army's program, uh, there was an opioid epidemic in 1969 in Vietnam. Um, it had gone on for 15 months and actually Richard Nixon, along with the Senator Hughes, who was a governor of Iowa, then Senator and actually a recovered alcoholic ambulance driver from World War II, decided that enough was enough that they needed to pass legislation and the legislation literally was the secretary will identify and treat all active duty who are drug or alcohol dependent. Well, what happened in Vietnam was that, you know, no psychiatry, they just detox people before they came home. And uh, Lee Robbins did a follow-up study in uh, the 70s of that group and it was a 95% remission rate. People didn't relapse once they came back home because they never used here. The ones that did relapse were the ones that had begun use in the United States. So that automatically, for me, kind of looks at the importance of your social environment. Now, with um, Senator Hughes, so if you're going to do opioids, you better put alcohol into the legislation, too. So that's why it was alcohol and drugs. And am I, am I uh, slow enough and clear enough? Oh, good. <laughs> um, appreciate that. <laughs> So, um, so my career, I had an unusual project in the 90s, which was to figure out why, you know, what, what the military programs were doing. And at that time, it wasn't civilian standard of care, but if you were identified with a, well, the drugs got into the Reagan era, just say no, and I have to say that that, you know, might not have been the greatest approach, and I, I think the military is still recovering from that. Um, but the, uh, but the alcohol side of it was uh, to, you know, what do you want? And the commands really wanted people to get back to work without relapse. And so the programs were designed for that. Um, uh, you would get into a uh, six-week program, and um, you would then go back to your unit that had sent you, and then the outpatient programs and prevention was geared towards deglamorizing alcohol use. Well, it turned out there was a lot of physical fitness, nutrition, anger, stress, time management, basically health promotion, spirituality was getting into the program. So with that bit of a background, okay, so here we you know, fast forward to Oxford House. Um, you are providing the kind of environment that people need to recover. So if I think of the 12-step meetings, well, what if I needed more than that, like 168 hours worth of where do I live? And here you are. You know, so it really is, I think, a successful model, and it is the only one that has been researched. There's actually a randomized clinical trial that 
uh, Dr. Um, Jason and you know, the, the group at DePaul University had, and that was critical for getting this the um, you know into the National Registry of Evidence-Based Programs and Practices. But fundamentally, what that trial was is that if someone was discharged from an inpatient program in Chicago, and, and I think it was black women, um, that was the cohort, um, the group that was offered. Um, you know, care as usual versus the group that wanted to go to Oxford House first. They would apply to get into an Oxford House and then do whatever it is you're going to do. That literally doubled the remission rate just by inserting Oxford House as part of the discharge plan. So, and, and, and you know yourselves that um, uh, you know, how many people have been in the jails, have been homeless, and once in an Oxford house, how many people become so, you know, as productive as you are today? You know, it, it's like, oh, I get to reset, you know, kind of where, where I was before this all became a problem. And, you know, it's, it, it really is, you know, the healthy home environment, and some people never had it. But here you, here you find that in Oxford house. Um, the, uh, the, the other thing that's really striking, um, and, and this is you know, kind of, an, for me, an odd uh, association, but, the, but what's happened with COVID? You have done better than the rest of the country. Um, you know, <laughs> seriously. You, when, when I heard the numbers, I think early, they've gone up a little, but the total number of, of cases, there's 45,000 person years. I mean, people come and go, but, if you, but the, the, over 2020, it was about 45,000 people that had the advantage of being able to live in an Oxford house. And in that group, initially, you know, in the first, there's maybe 50, maybe there's a few more cases now, but the only states that beat that was, you know, actually, uh, Paul Malloy's, you know, Vermont, I think, might have done a little bit better, but I don't think any other state has done as well as Oxford House. And, uh, and, 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 you, and, and, and you are in really high-risk areas. I mean, you're in Louisiana, you're in Texas, you're in you know, Florida, you know. Well, you go across the country. So um, now we get into what did you do? Put the mask on. Really great. Now, here's where, you know, chance for education here. Um, why do they say to cover the mouth and the nose? Well, you know, it's all right to prevent spread. The droplets will go six feet. That's why we got the social distancing of six feet. So, well, actually, it's kind of an aerosol. They sneeze and it can go maybe, oh, that might be 27 feet. But the mask is really protective, but also because the, where does the virus go? How do you become infected and how do you, be, how do you infect others? It's up here. So, you know, in that nasal area. Why do people lose smell? lose taste, it's kind of, you know, kind of where the virus is replicating. And whether you have symptoms or not, if the virus is able to replicate, out it goes. And, that, and the mask blocks that. Um, now, you know, there's a, articles about how, you know, how good the masks, it, it really is, there's a lot in terms of how good it should fit, you know, it shouldn't leak out here, you know, it, you know cover this because, you know, that's kind of where all the replication is. Um, but, um, but it does work, and, and you're, you're, you're living proof of that, yeah, seriously. So, you know, it's not about medications as much as what you're doing. And now moving into, I think, a few moments in, into, because I've heard the MAT medications, a lot of the, uh, we have a tendency medically uh, to think along um, one axis, physical, you know, medical. Oh, might not be there. Maybe it's on the psychological axis, you know, X, Y. And actually, Descartes himself was a priest, I believe. So, you know, it actually kind of fit that model. But we tend not to see diseases in maybe even two dimensions. We see it in one dimension. And how does it look in one dimension? How does it look in two dimensions? Well, the other thing that people start to talk about now is the social determinants of health. And what is the social determinant? Oh, housing, food, you know, jobs. Uh, yeah, finances, all of that wraps up. So if you look at a problem and health in three dimensions, moving through time, this is what you're doing. And as you're doing that, um, you're, getting into a, you're getting a much higher rate of, pro, pro, of um, uh, probability of recovery. I can design programs, that's what I also learned. If I want the program as a system to be 2% successful, I know how to do that, basically in smoking, tobacco, Tell somebody, give them three minutes of a little lecture, 
about 2% will listen and they'll actually stop smoking. Wow, you know, 2%. It's cost effective too, actually, given the lives that will be saved with that. But if I wanted to run it to 80%, I kind of do what's happened with Oxford Houses or with AA. You know, it's, it's, it's long, it, it's, it, you jumpstart and go over time and look at it three-dimensionally. Now, MAT, you know, I don't see, I, from when I prescribe medications, it's kind of with a purpose. It's not that the medication is gonna cure much. There, there are some times, yes, it really is the answer. But most of the times, it's kind of like the catalyst, and especially in psychology and, psych and, and, and uh, where, where you know, I have to change something and I'm gonna have to work at it. If I were um, learning to run, uh, my, my gait is lousy and I need a trainer to run differently or I need to play golf and I have a lousy golf swing, um, it's gonna take time to train and, and, and be comfortable with a new technique that might be a whole lot better. Well, that's kind of happening, that, that, that happens with a lot of the cognitive behavioral therapies. You know, you're, you, you know here's the education, here's how it applies to you, try to motivate to kind of, yes, I'm gonna take, do some things. I'm not gonna like, it's hard to do, it's, it's, but, but I can do anything for a month, but it's gonna take three to six months and that gets into the stage of change model to be comfortable with that. And once I'm comfortable, I'm, I'm getting into recovery. So that's why you hear these six months or longer for living in Oxford House, why there's such a difference. Because you, you, you've, you've, you've been around people long enough and, and been influenced. We do things in groups. If I don't know what's wrong with a person, sometimes I just look at the group they're in, you know, and that's that can be diagnostic sometimes in itself. So it's it's really it's it's a it's a, a fascinating um, area when you think of you know what's what Oxford House has accomplished, and at at at, at very high you know cost efficiency. Um, the the um, I was going to say something about the, uh, you know, with the, with the outcome. Yeah, so if I want to hit the 80% mark, you know, I, I, I can jumpstart to, to a residential or detox. I can medicate to kind of take away the, some of the urging and cravings and desire to drink. But recovery is a behavior, you know, so we can talk about addiction as a disease of the brain. But another phrase that maybe hits a more psychosocial model would be what's the opposite of addiction? It's connection. And the connection, when I think of, oh, I have a gambling, I have this, I have other, uh, you know, I, the addiction is kind of the out of control. I, I will give up everything, you know, dopamine release and everything else. This, this takes control over anything else that's important. But when I'm forming the connections, and this is what you do day by day, 168 hours a week in an Oxford house, you know, bonding with other people, helping each other, that's recovery. And so rather than focusing on the medication as much, and we'll have some talks about tomorrow and medication in Oxford House, but the idea is that, uh, you know, it's what you're doing day by day with each other that's really the critical thing. Um, any, and I, I think I should stop. <laughs> or uh, any questions? <laughs> yeah, well, that'll come up. Now. Thank you, Dr. Hoffman. I was just looking at, I remember that yellow bar, the yellow bars with the Harvard gentleman, you know, increases your chance 67%. Have you ever been in a house and they're like, man, we want to vote out having to work a program of recovery, you know? You ever, anybody ever have to do that, deal with that? You're voting out the only hope you got, right? So let me get to this. Okay. So, Mr. Sabbath, we're gonna. We, Mr. Sabbath sent us a video. You want to do stone? Okay. Okay. So okay. So backing up, the Honorable Kenneth Stone. Is it Fallon? Is it Fallon? Governor Fallon? It was, yeah. Governor Fallon. Okay. A, uh, Attorney Governor Fallon appointee. A Governor Fallon appointee has been both a county prosecutor and a criminal defense attorney since becoming an attorney in 2001. God, where were you when I needed you, man? This one's pretty short. Kenneth Stoner is a skilled attorney 
who has a wealth of experience in the law and criminal proceedings. His expertise and knowledge in working with those who have been charged with crimes related to untreated mental illness and substance abuse related offenses will help ensure they receive treatment and appropriate care. He is on our team. Let's give him a round of applause, man. Thank you. No, I don't know how to arm this, but somebody could set that up for me. I want to probably start with an apology. Um, whoever's lost phone that's out there uh, is probably my fault because I find that, you know, if you're like the common denominator, like wherever you go, there's the same problem. I just got back from one of my drug court for the last couple of weeks and I was like, hey, what's going on? I'm sorry, Judge, I missed my, I lost my phone. And uh, next person coming, hey, you missed your day, what's going on? I'm sorry, I lost my phone. And uh, then, I'm, then I'm here and people are losing their phones, it's probably my fault. Uh, I know, bad humor. But uh, anyway, so I, I wanted to start by saying uh, thank you because we have an incredible treatment court program in Oklahoma County. And we have a, about a, have you ever heard drug court set you up to fail? Uh, not in our county. We have, we have an 84% graduation rate. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, I mean, keep showing up and we'll work with you. But four out of five people come in our program and graduate. Our state average is about 66%. So, you know, we're almost 20% better than the state average. If I had to point to two things that really make the difference, uh, number one is just access to safe, stable, sober housing. We just have so much more of it in our community than some of the rural communities and also the peer support that we have in our, in our, in our courtroom. And our peer support that have been there and they connect people with, with housing, I get far more credit than I deserve for the success of the program. It really goes to our, our Oxford partners and our sober living partners. So I wanna give you guys a hand. Uh, And, uh, and before I begin, the uh, I love these gratitude shirts, by the way. So, yeah. <laughs> but what, what am I, one of my favorite sayings is, uh, the struggle ends when the gratitude begins. The struggle ends when the gratitude begins. I don't, I don't have tattoos, but I think I'm going to get that one. I'm going to put it right there. Um, anyway, so... Uh, I've been around the courthouse for a long time, over 20 years, and I'm, I come from a place where we are the incarceration capital of the world, and, um, and, I, and I, I come from a profession of uh, judges and lawyers that we claim to be good at looking at evidence, yet we've not been very good at looking at the evidence because what we're doing is not working. And so uh, we've done some studies in our community. And uh, when you realize that about 75% of all the criminal cases that come into our courthouse, and I imagine it probably very slightly from county to county, but you're probably in this ballpark. So uh, if 75% of all the criminal cases have substance use, abuse, or addiction as a relevant factor, and if you look uh, at divorces and guardianship cases, 50%, Substance use, abuse, or addiction is a relevant factor. And we know that 83% of kids that go into DHS custody, one of the allegations that the home was unfit used to due to substance use, abuse, or addiction, yet our judges and our lawyers are just not well trained. And so I spend a lot of time sharing information, what I'm about to share with you, that I share, I try to get out to people in our community to try, try, try to really help change the dialogue and change the narrative and make our legal system more accountable and more relying on actual evidence um, uh, you know, of, of what is the underlying issue uh, because that's really the issues that, that drive people to the courthouse. If you don't address the underlying issue that got someone to the courthouse, we have a revolving door. They're just be coming back again. So um, the, as far as the mass incarceration, in Oklahoma, we do have a incarceration crisis. We're probably, I think, number two in the world uh, in terms of per capita incarceration. And I'm here to tell you that it's just not working. Uh, incarceration is, mass incarceration is just, it's really inexpensive, it costs a lot, and it doesn't work well. And what I mean by that is that people who are low risk, they come out and they're just a little bit worse than they went in. Uh, and so, you know, if, um, you know, like a, you know, we don't know each other, but if if I were to find the 
if you introduce me to the five people that you spend the most time with, it would tell me a lot about you, right? Well, if someone goes to prison, they come back in our community, you've just spent time with, with people that are a little bit more antisocial, uh, more likely not to want to follow the rules. Can you guys hear me back there okay? All right. Um, it, it tends to have actually very little effect on uh, higher risk people. And, uh, it, and considering that 93% of people that go to prison come back and live with us in our community, it really makes sense that we ask better questions about you know, who do we want as our neighbor and who do we want to, what do we want our community to look like. And w when you think about, people generally don't argue with the fact whenever I say, you know what, if you have diabetes before you go to prison, you're likely to have diabetes. You're going to have it when you get out, right? Well, I'm here to tell you, if, you, if you're schizophrenic before you go to prison, you're going to be schizophrenic when you get out. And you know what? If you got an addiction before you go to prison, you'll have an addiction when you get out, um, unless you have access to really meaningful treatment. And I don't necessarily mean the treatment that you might get in prison, not that there's anything wrong with it, but, <laughs> but treatment in prison is a little bit like learning how to ride a bicycle in a classroom. Um, you know, you don't learn how to snow ski by reading a workbook. You know, you're in a controlled environment where you really learn is out in the real world, where you have real world problems and life is happening and it's going on and you're learning and growing. And that's why, uh, you know, it's our treatment court environment and in, in sober living, you're learning how to get sober in, and stay sober and be in recovery in the world, in the real world. What are the problems? I think our problems is that we have a lot of biases. Uh, we have a lot of misinformation, a lot of misunderstanding. Um, I think there's incredible advancement in the last decade in what we're understanding about the human brain. Uh, and what I mean by that is, uh, man, I mean, just even some of the things that Dr. Kelly is, is, is teaching us. Uh, and what we're learning now about what they call neuroplasticity, it means your brain can, they used to think your brain was kind of set, but now they know, man, brains are, are dynamic and they're evolving and they're changing all the time. And your past does not have to equal your future. Uh, your brains can change. And I, I challenge our community, our, our, our leaders in our community to do what's, what's called zero to one innovation. And zero to one innovation is a, uh, is a it was, it's a, actually a business book was uh, by a guy named Peter Thiel. Peter Thiel is a billionaire Silicon Valley investor. He was Elon Musk's first partner in PayPal. But he wrote a book called Zero to One. And he said, what we need is more zero to one innovation. We come up, right now there's a lot of people that are making products that are existing products. And we add a few things to them. We make incremental improvements and make it a little bit better. So we take a product to six and let's make it a seven. Let's take something a little bit, let's make it better. So we gotta quit doing that. We gotta go all the way back to zero and start over from first principles. Like what, what are the resources we have? What are the problems that we're trying to solve and rebuild it from the ground up? And that's called zero to one innovation. That's what I've been challenging people to do as it relates to our criminal justice system is rethinking all of this from the ground up. It's not just about making minor adjustments here and there. Um, so I'm gonna keep going here. <laughs> and when, I, when I talk about misconceptions, this, this guy, he's from my home state. He says, it ain't what you know that gets you. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. Uh, and and we, we have a lot of people that are pretty confident about what they know, and, they, and they're just wrong. I'm just telling you, they're just wrong. Uh, and, uh, and we've all got to pull I, I had After my first panel, I had people come up and ask, well, what, what can we do? And I'm, I'll tell you what, this is the war. This is part of the battle here is changing the perception of an understanding of addiction. So uh, this article uh, was first published in 1997, a little over 20 years ago. It was called Addiction is a Brain Disease and It Matters. It was published in a major scientific journal. And at the time, it was a very, it was a really groundbreaking concept. I mean, for the first time, someone's saying, wait, this is something that's treatable. It's more like a disease. Uh, and it really started getting people thinking. And, and for all, some of you older folks in here, I mean, I'm 53, uh, 20 years really wasn't that long ago, you know? Uh, and things are moving really quickly. Now, there is, uh, there's a dialogue here that tends to get people off track. And I'm going to introduce you to a guy named Mark Lewis. He's very smart. He's a neuroscientist. Uh, he wrote a book called The Biology of Desire and Why Addiction is Not a Disease. And so this creates a weird dynamic in this community where people argue it's a disease and it's not a disease. This is not helpful at all whenever you realize what's really going on. These are academic nerds, I'm sorry, arguing over 
how to classify something. They're saying, because his argument is it's a disorder. We shouldn't call it a disease because it's a disorder. And so some people are in camp disease and some people are camp disorder. It doesn't matter. Anybody who is intelligent and well-informed in this, in this topic, all the experts agree that there is a lack of meaningful choice and that compassionate treatment is the best option. Uh, and we have, we have a, a, a brain issue. Uh, so the four C's of addiction, compulsive control, loss, uh, com uh, loss of control, continued use despite harm and cravings. I kind of dial in on that third one, continued use despite harm. And it is generally not the person who's suffering is the one that is best attuned to whether or not the continued use is causing harm. Um, this is how much Americans drink, and it's broken down by 10% of our population. So if you look, there's about the bottom one third of us drink nothing at all. There's about another third of us drink just a little bit. And then there's about 10% about of it drink about 15, this is drinks per week, by the way, 15 drinks a week, about two drinks a night. There's about 10% of us that drink 73 drinks a week. It's about 10 drinks a day. Um, and so I like to show this and ask people, do we think that alcohol is addictive? And it's, I gotta tell you, it's a little bit of a trick question because actually it's not for some people, but it is for other people. So the, this top 10%, it's definitely addictive for them and it's maybe not as addictive for some other people. So instead of focusing on the chemical hooks in the substance, we wanna talk about the opioid, we wanna talk about the alcohol, I, I think we're putting way too much emphasis on the chemical hooks, and maybe the better question is, what is it about that 10 for 15%? What problem do they have that alcohol solves for them? The alcohol is a solution. Um, and if, if, if we look at we, how do we solve those underlying problems, and then we're getting really to, to, to how we move forward. Uh, we, we talked about the Surgeon General Report. The numbers in here are staggering, by the way. Uh, about 93 million people binge drink, use illicit drugs, or misuse prescription drugs. I asked my legal assistant one time, like, how do I demonstrate that? Well, that would be the entire population of everything you see right there. That's every man, woman, and child in those states. Now, about 20 million people uh, meet the cl clinical criteria for a substance use disorder, and only about 10% of them retrieve treatment. And uh, the 20 million Americans would be every man, woman, and child in these, in these areas. And by the way, I didn't choose red or blue by any kind of political <laughs> choices. It just what it came out to be, okay? So um, our Surgeon General says, it's the, the, the past approaches these issues, these have been rooted in misconceptions and prejudice, uh, and these are preventable and treatable conditions. So the impediments to recovery uh, are interesting. I think it, if you could boil it down to a couple things is a, the ancient Greeks used to say there's two sins that underlie every other sin. And the two sins that we could always find as a root was a lack of patience and hubris. We're impatient, we want things and we want them now, and, uh, and we also think we're really, we know what we know, we, you know so that, and that's on, on our side in terms of our community. Um, but if you start understanding what's going on that six inches between our ears, there's a tug of war that's always going on between the midbrain and the forebrain. So prefrontal cortex is that area, it's right behind your forehead. That is your part of your brain that is, makes you uniquely human. It's a, it's a home of what they call executive function. Executive function is the part that understands the future consequence of current behavior. It's a home of impulse control. It's also the home of our morals and values. And the seat of addiction is there more towards the, the midbrain or down lower, and it's our more primitive brain. And there's this tug of war. And when you see addiction, it's a struggle between the locus of control of your actions. There's a little bit of an oversimplification, but it's a, it's a, it's a struggle between your, your, your impulse control and your, your desires and your executive function and the, and the midbrain. What causes that? What causes that? And it's actually a combination, or it's one, two, three, or four, a combination of things. If you start looking at the genetics, have play a huge role, far more than we ever thought. We look at early use, like what time did, when did you start using? Uh, poor, people are self-medicating the symptoms of mental health. They have unresolved trauma. Uh, and so it's one of these things or all of these things. And we all learning about adverse childhood experiences, adverse childhood experiences like PTSD for kids, and it really disrupts the architecture, the architecture of your developing brain. And if you look on this very 
the bottom rung there, it talks about adverse child experiences create disruptive neurological development, and it kind of goes all the way up to uh, disease, disability, and, and uh, we'll say addiction really is kind of the foundation of it. Genetics play a big role. Uh, about f genetics account for about 50% of addiction. Now, it doesn't really cause addiction, but it causes what they call a susceptibility to addiction. So for example, uh, so when somebody has a drink, the way they process it and the way that they experience uh, their dopamine, uh, it, it could be anchoring different in their brain. And so for someone to say, well, I can quit drinking, therefore you should quit drinking. In some ways, it's almost like saying, I can eat peanuts, therefore you should eat peanuts. You should be able to eat peanuts. I'm not lactose intolerant. You shouldn't be lactose intolerant. Um, one, one interesting example of that, there's what they call a reward deficiency syndrome is, is a, a part of addiction. There's some of us that are born with kind of high dopamine and some of us are kind of born with low dopamine, right? This is a, dopamine is your neurotransmitter that, that has caused you to focus and perseverate and to, to, to uh, take action. And so some of us are born as tiggers. Yeah. And, and by the way, I'm sorry. I'm, yeah, I'm sorry. Tiggers always been a little bit annoying to me, but, um, <laughs> well, I say that because I think they won the genetic lottery. They just wake up and they're happy every day. I mean, it's awesome. Uh, but then, but some of us are some of us are Eeyores. I mean, we're just doing the best that we can to get through. And I would tell you, nobody chooses to be a Tigger or an Eeyore. You're just kind of born that way. It's kind of your set point. Does anybody have any idea who's more likely to become wrapped in addiction? Eeyore, that's correct. Now, the, some people argue that Tiggers are more likely to try it. Like, that might be true, but Eeyore is one that might continue to use because it makes them feel, I, I got a lot of people that come to my court that are, you know, facing very serious criminal problems. And you ask me, well, when did you start using? And it's usually my teenage years. Like, why'd you start? I, it, it helped me feel normal. <laughs> I felt very comfortable to relax and I could interact with other people. And, and, uh, and I, I thought, well, what's, what's, What's wrong with that aspiration to want to be able to feel like you can be normal? Um, now, we might disagree with how you get there, but, but it's a normal human aspiration. Uh, teen use, if you start using a substance whenever you're a teenager, you're far more likely to be hardwiring your brain for addiction. In fact, 40% of kids who begin drinking at 15 will become alcoholics. If you wait till you're, till you're 21, it's 7%. And the reason is there's a lot of as your brain is developing, there's a lot of what they call synaptic pruning. That means your, your brains are trimming off things that they don't need. And if you end up never using your impulse control, your brain says, we don't need this, and it kind of clips it off. If you never get good at emotional regulation or mood regulation or self-soothing, it says, we don't use that, we don't need it, and it gets trimmed off. Not that you can't relearn it or rebuild it, but it's not nearly as natural. It's not as easy. It's more of a challenge. And so you've heard the saying, if you don't use it, you lose it. And that's what's going on there in teenage brains. It happened very rapidly. There's also something called millenniation, which is that you've ever heard this idea that neurons that fire together, wire together. So it's habit forming. So what you do as a teenager, you start creating these really fast uh, connections in your brain. And, and so this, this chart right here just shows you all the different levels of brain developments going on in the green as your adolescent years. And so you introduce a mood altering substance uh, during the time your brain is developing and you kind of get it hardwired that way, unfortunately. But that doesn't mean you can't change. It just makes it more of a challenge. So what's going on here? I'm going to show you this is a Venn diagram that I came up with to try to help People understand addiction because people will say, well, I, I have the genes and I'm not addicted. Or guess what? I may start using it at 17 and I'm not addicted. Or I have a mental health issue, but I'm not addicted. I'm like, yeah, okay. But here's what we're talking about. In addiction, if you look what's underneath it, it's always one of these things. And depending on where you are in the green, you might be just underlying a little bit of trauma you might have trauma and learned behavior. You might be kind of in the middle. You got the trauma, the learned behavior, and the genetics. <laughs> and some people are self-medicating the symptoms of mental illness. And I want to just go around here real quick and point out, I don't know anybody that chooses their genetics. I don't know anybody that chooses to have mental illness. I don't know anybody that chooses to have trauma. And God help us if we judge people for their worst decisions when they were 15 years old. They started using when they were a teenager. And so when you look at addiction that way, what is really going on here? Uh, it, it really makes a great case for compassionate treatment is the answer rather than mass incarceration. Um, yeah. now, now here's the paradox. You can choose to get out of that. <laughs> 
<laughs> you may not choose to get there, but once you know the answer, it is your choice if you want to start developing the skills and relearning the impulse control and relearning the other stuff. And first getting into first getting into abstinence, which is sobriety, is just not using. That's what we do in our drug court. We kind of make people not use in the beginning, but they migrate into recovery. And recovery is not just not using. It's actually being sober because that's a chosen way of life. That's what they want to do. Um, it's voluntarily maintained lifestyle. It's improving your physical health, your mental health, your social well-being, a, spirit, a sense of spirituality. The, the big shots got together. They don't like us using the word spirituality, so they call it citizenship now. But it really is citizen <laughs> a spirituality uh, and a, an overall improved quality of life. It's where you want to stay. So one of the biggest problems with um, with addiction, and when I talk to people in the community about, they have this reductionist thinking, this really simple thing. It's like, well, you just need to stop using, like, as if that's just the problem. And it's like, people that don't understand this is a systems issue. This is not just one thing, it's an entire system. And this list that is what it takes to be in recovery, I did not create this list for Oxford. This is the list that I show everybody, but number one in the list is safe, stable, sober housing. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, it, it, it really almost matters more than anything. And, and also the second is healthy relationships and positive peer associations. Physical health, changing your physical health, your employment, having access to meaningful work, uh, spirit, spirituality. Spirituality, by, by, people get hung up on that sometimes. It really, people kind of tie it with religion. And yeah, it certainly is tied to it, but it doesn't have to be. Um, you know, in the recovery community, spirituality is, you know, that, that which is, between us and that which is beyond, you know, that which is between, that which is beyond. That's a, a really, and that kind of mystery, whatever that is. Uh, healthy habits, man, I'm telling you, just what it means to get good sleep can be a game changer for somebody. If you have a good place to stay and good routines, it really can help a lot. Mood regulation, community connections. Uh, one, one way to try to understand it, it's not being helpful here. Okay, so I made this up. Imagine being stuck in traffic. You're stuck in traffic and you got four lanes on both sides and you got 20 cars deep. And this is a view of the person in the, in the light blue as a substance use disorder. And you're looking at the back windshield and they're trying to go forward. And you're looking at what all is in front of them. If you look at right in front of them is the substance use. And people say, well, well, let's get that substance use out of the way. That will fix everything. I'm like, well, you don't understand. You, you've got to get out in front of that car because if you remove that, you're still stuck. You got the car in front of them and the car in front of them. And so you got to get out in front and try to figure out, okay, what is it at the very beginning? And you get all the traffic moving kind of at the same time in a system. Uh, that's what we're talking about, the stable housing and the job and the peer support and the encouragement, uh, healthy habits and maybe cognitive behavioral therapy and the peer support. And that's what it takes to kind of get the traffic jam unstuck. And that's why um, it really is, it's not nearly as simple as, as some people want to make it to be. But anyway, that's probably, I want to do a little plug for treatment course because that's what I do. They, they really do work. Uh, people can and do change. Uh, change is not just possible, but it's probable and predictable. Uh, and I, I, if, as far as treatment courts, if you're lucky enough to be in a good one, uh, it, it, it really is probably one of the few programs in our criminal justice system that get a gold star because at least not everyone is the same, but generally they have pretty good outcomes in very difficult uh, cases. So anyway, I'm gonna go here, for my, uh, there's my email address and um, Phone number if I can ever do it for you, let me know. And thank you so much for what you do. And if I can help you, thank you. Man, Oklahoma got it going on right there. How many, how many people here have had to have judicial intervention? Raise your hand. That, about 89% of the room. So I want to do something for this man. Um, because they, they go, they have a, light, a high success rate. And then we get on, we got the traffic moving, and they start moving around in life. And they don't, we don't come back and say, hey, thank you. So let's all stand up.
and say thank you. Thank you. And we can't say that loud enough. I had to do that, man. You know, because we're the blessing. I had judicial interview. I was a drug court in Multnomah County. Uh, so, man, that, that was a big thing for, for our heart right there. So, Oxford House says thank you, you know. Oh, I got to get back to this. I was fired up there. Hang on. I got to hold up. Okay. Uh, we don't have Mr. Sabbath here, but we do have a video from him. This panel is awesome, I'm telling you. Mr. Sabat is an affiliate of the Institution for Social and Policy Studies and the Medical School of Yale. We got Yale, got Harvard, got everybody here. And dubbed the, by NBC News as the prodigy of drug politics author, consultant, and advisor to three U.S. presidential administrations. Kevin, Kevin A. Sabat, PhD, has studied, researched, and written about research written about and implemented drug policy for 25 years. He is currently the president and CEO of SAM, Smart Approaches to Marijuana. Now that everybody's paying attention now, right? A nonprofit organization he founded with Congressman Patrick Kennedy and David Frum. His latest book, Smokescreen, What the Marijuana Industry Doesn't Want You to Know, is distributed by Simon & Schuster. He is the only, I gotta read that. He is the only person appointed by Republican and Democrats to work at the White House Drug Office. That's a big deal. And he is a columnist for Newsweek. He received his doctorate from Oxford University. Let's welcome his video. Hi everybody, I'm Kevin Sabad, and uh, I want to thank you and thank Oxford House and Paul Malloy and everybody uh, for the enormous work you have done to pull this off. I am sorry that I am not there in person. Um, the present circumstances won't allow it, but it is an honor to be here virtually with you and to be joined by um, Wilson Compton and Judge Stoner and John Kelly all of whom I have enormous respect for. So it's really an honor for me to be here. Uh, I'm just gonna speak with you for a couple of minutes about an issue that I think is, is really kind of the elephant in the room often in, in our discussions. Um, you know, there, there are so many discussions to be had on drugs. It's easy to forget, you know, important ones. But one that I think is particularly important that we shouldn't forget about is the issue of marijuana. And I'm gonna present very briefly, um, you know, what would normally be a much longer presentation, but I'm going to do uh, very um, kind of very quickly um, to give you an update really on where we are and where I am in my thinking and where Sam and, and other folks are organizations. Uh, you know, we collaborate with um, multiple um, uh, health groups and medical groups around the country. And of course, we were founded by former Congressman Patrick Kennedy, who's one of the most well-known people, I think, in recovery in our country. Um, and there is a book that I have recently written called Smokescreen, What the Marijuana Industry Doesn't Want You to Know, which uh, I think some of you have on your, uh, some, some of you might have been uh, lucky enough to grab or unlucky enough to get, I guess. Um, but I am very proud of it. It's a book that took me many, no, actually a long time to write that really exposes the uh, marijuana industry and goes behind the scenes on, a, on these critical issues. And so, um, you know, maybe we can go into it in depth one, one time, one year, um, but I think it is a important, I hope, important contribution. You know, there are three issues in the marijuana discussion that often get conflated. Uh, first being the decriminalization of, of marijuana use and this idea of penalizing drug users. Second being the medicinal use of compounds derived from marijuana. And then third being, you know, the, really the legalization of use, sales, and production. And, 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 and distribution. And these are three very, very different things that I think often get conflated. Um, you know, the big issue that I'm concerned about right now is the fact that we have major for-profit interests whose business it is to increase addiction in our country. And that's really, I would call them the modern day big tobacco, but they're, they're actually are big tobacco. Big tobacco is heavily invested, whether it's Altria, Philip Morris, and there are so many um, tobacco companies, by the way, and alcohol companies that are very invested in this 
um, in, in marijuana. And it's really following the addiction for profit model, the model that brought, you know, Purdue Pharma um, billions of dollars, the model that brings alcohol billions of dollars, tobacco billions of dollars, and of course, marijuana billions of dollars now. And it's following the same playbook, which is essentially, um, you know, you don't need a whole lot of people addicted to your product. You just need those that are addicted to use your product often. And, and that is what we're seeing uh, with the marijuana industry today. It's something that I think is very concerning. And why this matters is if you look at the percent of past month users who consume daily or near daily in our country, you compare marijuana to alcohol, there's no contest. Marijuana has surpassed alcohol of, of daily, non-daily, uh, near daily users. And that is something very concerning. This isn't about you know, occasional use. This is really about heavy, heavy use. And that's translated to about 10 times as many marijuana users daily today than we had in 1992. That's a big difference. That's a very big big number and a very big difference. Um, and we're not talking about the old joints that a lot of people you know, might be acquainted with. We're talking about things that look very different, the candies, the ice creams, the oils, the dabs, the 99% potent you know, concentrates. Things have really, really changed over the last 30 years. We've, we've genetically bred marijuana in a very efficient way to get the THC. And that's what's producing a lot of the harms. Um, you know, The last time I spoke with you all, I was joined by the Surgeon General um, but it's not just Republican Surgeons General that care about this. It's also, you know, our current Surgeon General, Vivek Murthy, who has said that public policy is outpacing the science when it comes to marijuana. He said that in the past. Um, this is not a partisan issue, nor should it be. I served three White House administrations um, from, you know, various parties. This should not be a partisan issue at all. Um, we need to understand that, that, you know, marijuana use disorder and addiction is real. Um, there was a recent study by, by Nora Wilson and other colleagues about the prevalence of marijuana use disorder being almost double that of cigarettes and alcohol uh, among teens when you look at, um, you know, since time of initiation. When you look at the states that have legalized, whether it's poison control uh, calls, whether it's emergency room mentions, whether it's use and the volume of use, we are seeing increases. Um, study after study has shown an increase of likelihood of not just marijuana, but even alcohol, the study by Bailey and colleagues. Um, and and we're, uh, this is alarming because we're seeing daily use among 12th graders uh, go, go up and now surpass alcohol and cigarettes, which is remarkable. Um, you know, the latest data is 6.9% of 12th graders, it's probably a little bit more than that even. Um, that is worrisome. And when you look at the studies showing that a quarter of past year users have addiction among kids in legal states, uh, that, is, that is very, very worrisome. And so we're continuing to see increases. Uh, Nevada, Oregon, and Colorado have seen significant increases in youth marijuana use. And the last time we looked, uh, NISDA looked at, uh, looked at the data, when you look at the state estimates, other states uh, show mixed results depending on the, the data set you look at. But overall, we're seeing a picture that isn't good. We're seeing the opioid crisis worsening. Um, where marijuana has been legalized. We're seeing study participants um, that saying that marijuana use increased their desire for opioids. Uh, within one to six days, they returned to opioid use versus being such a, you know, a, a substitution, which is something we hear about a lot. Um, and we're not really seeing arrests go down all that remarkably. I mean, and that's not a surprise. Alcohol has more arrests than all drugs combined in our country, and that's legal. So there are plenty of reasons why people would still be arrested. There's still, we're still seeing racial disparities. Um, you know, the, the, you know, dealer from the inner city is not making millions when it comes to legal marijuana. We're still seeing arrests. We're still seeing public use. Um, you know, we really have to understand this has not, this has been sold as social justice, but really isn't. And it's something that I'm concerned about. Uh, just in the last few minutes, you know, there are policy solutions. I don't think that legalizing marijuana federally, which is what a few senators want to do, for example, Cannabis Administration and Opportunity Act, I don't think that's a good idea. I think that's going to follow in the footsteps of big tobacco and big alcohol. In states that have legalized, there are things we can do. We can restrict THC concentration. We can make sure the marijuana industry doesn't contribute to rulemaking bodies, to determining regulations. In states that have not legalized, we can remove criminal penalties, but we can still discourage marijuana use through science-based awareness campaigns, prevention, intervention, and treatment. We should not give up on that. Um, I think it's really key. We have a lot of resources on our website um, that you can go to. 
you know, the, I will end with, you know, we have to understand that this does, this policy um, issue does not end with marijuana. We are now seeing multiple states go towards the legalization of all drugs. And, you know, they couch it in terms that we've heard before, whether it's decriminalization or medical purposes or, you know, psilocybin for um, PTSD. But the end goal absolutely is the full legalization of drugs. We're seeing this in British Columbia already, where um, government really isn't stopping pure heroin and pure methamphetamine from being handed out. Incidentally, British Columbia has probably the worst uh, opioid addiction and overdose problem in the developed world. Um, they have been doubling down on um, these measures that accommodate use versus doubling down on measures like Oxford House, which we know is, is so effective. And I, I'm very concerned about that. Um, people constantly mischaracterize Portugal. They did not legalize drugs. Um, but culture is really what also is very, very important. So uh, anyhow, we are trying to impact policy through multiple ways, prevention, education, science, media engagement, industry accountability, and advocacy. We absolutely could use your help. If you want to learn more about the marijuana issue, talk more about it, please contact us at our website, learnaboutsam.org. Uh, my email is there on the bottom. I'd love to hear from you. Um, and again, I'm sorry I can't be there in person, um, but you all are in my thoughts, and I hope to see you next year. Thanks so much. All right, we had some heavy hitters right there. Let's have them, uh, let's give them another round of applause. Still, that stuff is riveting now. It's like, it's, it's, it's indescribable how, how self-destructive I was. So this kind of brings it all home. Uh, we do have time for about five or six questions. If somebody wants to come up to the mic, is that mic hot? It is. Does anybody have any questions for our panel? Hi, my question is for the first speaker. Um, I was really interested about the mechanisms that you were studying. Hang on one sec, one sec, please. It could, if everybody could just kind of hold it down because we can't really hear the, the question. If, thank you, sir. Uh, in your research into the mechanisms whereby uh, AA you know, helps with um, helping people get past addiction, um, did you do any, were you able to define um, maybe the way that the profit motive uh, plays into that. And I thought um, maybe, the, maybe you could address that as well because you talked about um, some court programs that were very effective. Um, when I came into Oxford House, the thing about it that was very different was the, the altruism, the lack of a profit motive. And that was something that I, I hadn't seen before. And I wondered how that shows up um, in your research and also as well as in your experience. Okay, I'll make, while you're getting that hot there, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, we, our, our, the, nobody really makes any money at all in, in, uh, in our, uh, all of our treatment providers are nonprofit organizations, and it's really kind of driven by the fact that we're arguing and fighting that we're saving money, and that, and that, that, that gets some traction, but the idea that that uh, our legislatures can in invest, you know, put one dollars in, and they get four dollars return back on it. And cost savings is really what drives it. It's a, it's a, there is an economic engine that is around saving money is probably what propels. It. We we got to just fight like crazy for anything. It is it. I, I was argue, I try to get. I print a lot of color certificates for incentives in my program, and I have a hard time getting convincing them to give me four hundred dollars for colored ink. That's how difficult it is sometimes. Uh, but. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, I think, you know, I, I, if I'm understanding the question correctly, I, I don't think that the mechanisms of behavior change would differ uh, necessarily 
depending on whether there was a profit or non-profit motive. Where I think it makes a difference is in just the pure accessibility of the intervention. Because AA is free, it's easily accessible in most communities where people live. And so they have free access at any time of day, any time of the week, particularly in the evenings and weekends when formal services are not available. But AA has a unique, and similar groups have a unique uh, potential to mobilize those mechanisms, to give people access to those therapeutic mechanisms. And I think that's where uh, groups like AA are so powerful. Thank you, thank you. Okay, uh, next question please. Um, I was just wondering if there's any chance in the near future, like with our judicial system, if maybe those stereotypes become less and less and, um, you know, rehabilitation over incarceration, like how far away are we from that? And like, you know, what, what would help the process move further along? Is it just information, you know? Yeah, That's all. I, I, well, I think we're, I mean, at, le at least I can speak from my own community there we are it does seem like we're at kind of a watershed moment in terms of there's been a building momentum and there's more and more and so there does tend to be this like compound effect like two people tell four four tell eight eight tell 16 it just kind of keeps expanding and we are uh we're making progress but boy it's a, it's a it's a long way to go and people get off we're humans are weird creatures we get really set in our ways and and uh, we don't like ideas that are different than what we have and that's probably what's driving a lot of our political division really being open to new ideas so I, I will tell you the newer younger generations coming in the new prosecutors the new uh, they're more open they are uh, and so I really couldn't put a timeline on it but I am I am cautiously optimistic that uh, um, at least in the next decade we'll have a more humane system thank you thank you thank you that's a good question right there yes ma'am hello this is Kimberly from Colorado Springs. I'm not sure if this question is specifically for you guys, but I just want to know what we are doing to help support those outreach workers that weren't able to come here today due to the choice of not getting the vaccine. Mm. <laughs> I can speak from personal experience. We have a uh, coworker in uh, Tennessee that chose not to get vaccinated. And we, for the last month, we've been sending her love and telling her that we're going to miss her here. You know, I mean, there's some things are beyond our control. Mm -hmm. And all we can do is send our love and know that she's missed. And she's very much missed by our whole team, by our whole state. And that's all I can know. I mean, I don't know what else we can do, but we do look forward to seeing her again. Okay, thank you. One more question? We have, one, we have time for one more. Hi, I'm Kevin from Oklahoma. Uh, your honor, it's nice to see you without your, your robe. <laughs> we can't understand you, man. I'll say it's nice to see you without your robe, your honor. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> I, was, I, I got a, like a two-part question. I was curious, how, how far away do you think we are from Oxford House being a standardized model for, for all inmates that are, that are in, incarcerated because of, of drug addiction? Yeah, uh, so, uh, the question is how, how far are we from being, having Oxford be a standardized model? My, what my hope is, is that we have a system where we measure and we understand and we have a treatment that meets a need. Not everybody, that, not everybody that's coming out of prison had an addiction, but everybody right, that right. does have addiction should be treated as if they have one. So, you know, not, uh, there's a lot of momentum. There's a sort of somewhat of a standardization movement in Oklahoma, you know, the, the right. certifying recovery residences. And so there's a lot of momentum. It wouldn't surprise me in the next decade if insurance companies start paying for Oxford House because it works so well. Right. I mean, you go to inpatient, you go to, you know, go to out, not really outpatient, but you go back into sober living, as a as a as an ingredient in, in sustained recovery because it works, uh, so that's a that's a possibility. But the DMH, we got a representative from DMH here that might be a better answer to that question. But I, it, it's on the horizon, I would bet. Do you know of any other program in the United States that touches these numbers that we put up for Oxford House residents as far as recovery? Well, you you, you combine. Uh, you combine AA and Oxford House together. I don't think right. there's anything that beats that. 
That's right. Thank you. All right. Let's have a round of applause for we have we're got to we got to get into the World Council now. Thank you all. I would, I, if you'd have more questions for them, I would grab their email addresses and, and, and address those. It'd be interesting to know what those questions were. Um, I would like to say thank you to the uh, uh, convention committee for even attempting to try to put this thing on. This has been a struggle. Uh, so let's, have, let's give them a round of applause as well. Thank you guys for putting this on. Seriously.